very dynamic and very visual reading. Uh, I'm really delighted to see such a wonderful panel tonight. Um, for the first uh, event, uh, the exciting event, I should say, in the series, I'm Newsmakers Perspectives on Global Media, which is co sponsored by the Overseas Press Club of America. As many of you know, our public events are a service to our community at large. And the topics actually reflect what is discussed in our classrooms, at the graduate level, at what we call pathways, career pathways, and diploma programs, which are non degree. Uh, and with our community, they also provide a lens on what is happening in the world. And tonight, of course, is no exception. One of the graduate degree concentrations that we have is called transnational security. This morning, students heard <coughs> from one of our full-time faculty who is doing a research this semester in Moscow. But he popped in, and so he spent two hours sort of providing insights on what is happening in Russia and with Putin. It's Mark Aliade, who's frequently quoted in the news, and you may have seen some of his quotes. Yesterday, five of our students, and some of them are actually sitting among you, uh, were working on a capstone project. It's a report on cyber terrorism with their professor, Michael Oppenheimer, to talk about the different sectors that each of them is investigating, which is going to result in five papers and one major paper. Uh, but in terms of providing a lens on what is happening in the world, I frequently turn to our administrators, one of whom is standing, she always hides, our sex team in the gray, she's waving, and our colleague, <coughs> Alexis Gelber, who seem to have a crystal ball in predicting what will happen months in advance. So could, who could, would have predicted that we would be in the midst of a major confrontation between the U.S. government and Apple, which exposes the clash between the needs of security, i.e. government, and client privacy, i.e. Apple, exactly at the same time, relative to tonight's conversation, on intelligence gaps in the age of an encryption, ISIS, security and surveillance. Alexis Galber, tonight's host, interlocutor, is an award-winning journalist, adjunct professor at NYU's Arthur L. Carter Journalism School, former longtime editor at Newsweek, founding books editor at the Daily Beast, editorial director of the human face of big data, and happily for us, a member of our adjunct faculty, and she teaches. She will introduce tonight's guests, Yahoo News Deputy Editor Daniel Clayman and Michael Isikoff, Chief Investigative Correspondent for Yahoo News. Join me in welcoming Alexis and her guests. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction here. Uh, uh, I am thrilled to have uh, Dan Biden and Mike Isikoff here this evening. Um, uh, they uh, are, as, as you were saying, Dan is the deputy editor of Yahoo News and the author of a book uh, with a title, a provocative title, Kill or Capture the War on Terror and the Soul of the Obama Presidency, uh, which came out. We'll be talking about that later in the evening. And uh, Mike is the chief investigative correspondent for Yahoo News. Um, he is a journalist who has broken so many stories that it would actually take up our entire evening here to enumerate all of them. So um, we will just uh, start our conversation. Uh, uh, the idea for this panel came out of a piece that uh, that Dan and Mike wrote right after the Paris terror attacks. Uh, they wrote a great piece for Yahoo News. Um, uh, it was way ahead of the curve uh, among their competitions, basically about how the rise of encryption 
and uh, the new kind of uh, messaging platforms had made it very difficult for the intelligence community to track the terrorists behind the terrorist attacks. Um, and uh, as Bureau was saying, not only did that turn out to be um, prescient, but here we are uh, dealing with this pitched battle between um, Apple and the FBI right now. And I thought we might just start off with that and uh, love to hear your take on where things stand right now, who's on what side. Um, yesterday, uh, James Comey, the head of the FBI, admitted that they had bungled uh, their attempt to kind of crack the uh, code of the, uh, the iPhone um, uh, that was uh, in, in charge of the care of one of the, uh, the, the terrorists, uh, and they made it actually more difficult. Uh, and so is the FBI looking to Apple to cover up their bumbling or what? <laughs> yeah. Well, look, it is um, an amazing confrontation you know, uh, and I think vexing for a lot of people because this like crystallizes the tension between um, security and privacy. And both sides, the FBI and Apple, are sort of using this case um, for their own larger purposes. Uh, and you know, in some ways, when you look at the details, uh, I think you see that the, the larger issues room larger than the specific issues about this phone. Um, and let me just give you uh, an example of that. Um, you know, when the FBI uh, made this, uh, made its first court filing on this, it presented this as though um, it needed Apple to help them unlock the keys to this, to the iPhone of the San Bernardino terrorist because it needed to figure out whether there were any co-conspirators involved. In fact, I have the, the initial filing I brought with me, and that's exactly what they said, you know. Uh, Farouk and Malik, those were the San Bernardino uh, killers, died later that day in a shootout with law enforcement. The government requires Apple's assistance to assess the subject device, that's the iPhone, to determine, among other things, who Farouk and Malik may have communicated with to plan and carry out the IRC shootings where Malik and Malik may have traveled to uh, and from before and after the incidents and other pertinent information. That suggests it's an open question. Did they have co-conspirators? Have you heard anything about that in this whole debate? Have you heard them talking about, oh my God, there might be other killers out there who were participated in the San Bernardino attacks? No, you haven't heard a word about that because the FBI pretty well knows at this point that they didn't have any co-conspirators. How do we know that? For one thing, you may remember there was a big debate during the Republican primaries, uh, in one of the Republican debates about the USA Freedom Act, which took effect November 29th, uh, two, three days before the, um, uh, the attacks. And that was the law that um, said the uh, NSA could no longer keep a database of everybody's phone calls. But if they needed phone records of anybody, metadata that would tell who anybody called and who called them and what time they got called, and, uh, they could get it through this uh, court process going to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Well, as it happened, I had interviewed um, Admiral Mike Rogers, the director of the NSA, on the Friday afternoon before the Apple filing. And this was the first opportunity anybody had to ask him about the USA Freedom Act, which took, had just taken effect. And I, one of the first things I wanted to ask him was, how did it work? Were you able to get the phone records? How long did it take? Uh, what about the San Bernardino case? And he confirmed, oh yeah, we got those phone records. They didn't show any uh, overseas connections and we got them within hours. So everybody who called that phone and every call that was made from that phone the NSA and the FBI already has those records. And they knew from the start that there was nobody who they were communicating with using that phone 
who was part of the San Bernardino attacks. And now, in addition to that, obviously, they did a massive investigation, as the FBI always does, and looked at you know anybody and everybody who had contacts with it. They had lots of other ways of, of talking to anybody associated. And there hasn't been a whisper or suggestion that these if this was anything but you know two lone wolves who were inspired by ISIS, as we've had many cases of, and you know uh, perpetrated this horrific act. Um, so that's not to suggest that there wouldn't be some you know uh, additional investigative uh, clues that might be on the phone that might tell us about. Um, who was on their contact list or you know, other information. But the basic idea that, that the FBI needs this phone unlocked to find out whether there was a co-conspirator really doesn't hold up to the evidence. Um, now, I could go on and we could talk later about how Apple is using this for its own purposes as well, and they clearly are. But all I'm saying is that whenever you get a you know, confrontation like this and, you know, dramatic claims being made by both sides about the significance of this, you, uh, 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 this is, you got to look behind and uh, you'll see that, you know, there's a, there's a political, strategic, public relations battle going on. That's important, but may not be exactly about what the two sides are trying to present. I just want to follow up uh, just very quickly uh, to what Mike just said. I think there's a there's a tactical slash legal uh, issue going on here, um, and then there's a cultural one, which at uh, the FBI, which Mike alluded to. The first one, um, I think the FBI would much rather um, fight this out in court um, and create a precedent. Uh, that would be favorable to law enforcement. Uh, the courts are going to be more favorable uh, to um, law enforcement and more deferential um, than I think Congress would be. And I think this is where they want the battle to be fought. Um, there are questions as to whether uh, this is actually the best case for them. The, the old adage that bad facts make uh, bad law, um, and there's a debate about that. The cultural point is what Mike alluded to uh, before, uh, which is that the FBI, I covered the FBI for uh, much of my career. Um, uh, Mike is exactly right in this particular case. Um, uh, there is, I'd say, almost certainly uh, no information um, on this phone uh, that would be, um, you know, really important to sort of cracking the investigation. As if they don't already know, um, but um, FBI agents, um, you know, they, they've got the profile of a classic investigator. Uh, I might add, not that dissimilar to Isikoff, um, which is they want to know absolutely everything. Um, uh, they want to, uh, uh, you know, turn over every every stone. It's just, um, um, it's just the way they are. Um, it's, it's in their DNA. Um, and I uh, talked to a, um, an FBI um, uh, source um, last week who was making exactly this point and was skeptical that there would be anything on that phone that would uh, really make a difference. But, um, and, and for a guy like uh, Comey, um, you know, I, I think that um, you know, at the sort of highest levels of the FBI, um, you know, they're also different. Um, I think they do. I think Comey is a guy um, who probably takes the sort of uh, security privacy, privacy um, you know, uh, you know, that balance you know, seriously. But uh, he has to defend um, his institution. Um, you have to you have to defend the building, as they say. Um, and I think um, he is not in a position, or at least he believes he's not in a position where. Um, uh, he can make those arguments. He's got to protect the institution. So um, I think that is a part of uh, of what's going on here. And if I, yeah. yeah, I just want to pick up on two quick points. One is, uh, yeah, the FBI <clears throat> would rather fight this battle in court than in Congress because a they 
who tend to have a better record of getting their way in court, especially when they presented in the kind of language that they did. Um, and, and, be, and if you go to Congress, then it becomes a political battle, and you're facing two issues. One is the privacy concerns that clearly resonate across the political spectrum. Absolutely. Not just liberal Democrats, but conservative Republicans were you know, among the most uh, uh, outraged. Ted Cruz voted for that USA Freedom Act, which took away the NSA's ability to store your uh, uh, phone records, um, and, um, and and then also just the simple dysfunction of Congress, uh, uh, and uh, you know trying to get any law passed today. Let um, alone um, anything as complicated as this. As, as, as this. But I should say, by the way, I thought that John Kasich in the last debate uh, did make a very good point, saying, "Where is the president?" on this, why, given the significance of this issue and given how polarized people uh, are, why hasn't he brought all the parties to the White House and, you know, as he suggested, lock the door and say, we're going to solve this. Well, We've he did this, and he, compromise. and he did this on uh, the metadata program, on the bulk collection program, uh, where he uh, created a commission, a review group. Um, and uh, brought in civil libertarians and people from law enforcement and people from the intelligence community, uh, and they produced a report, which I read actually a pretty serious report, which led to the Freedom um, Act. Um, so it may it may be that Obama will will still uh, do this. And 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 on the the, the kind of uh, political divide and and the and the you know even within the Republican Party. Um, Right after the Apple FBI clash uh, erupted, um, pretty much all the Republican candidates were asked about it, um, and um, it was pretty interesting to see how they responded. I mean, Marco Rubio, uh, I thought it was actually, a, uh, in some ways, an impressive answer. I mean, it was quite nuanced, um, kind of seeing the, the two sides of the argument and not really coming down um, on one side or the other. Donald Trump, on the other hand, um, you know, um, uh, his answer was bright colors rather than pastels, and, and um, uh, he uh, took the side of law enforcement pretty firmly. Um, and um, and actually, after that, everyone else did too. They all sort of fell in line. Which is interesting. And he tweeted that we should boycott Apple. And then he tweeted on his iPhone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so in the list which side today, the uh, Wall Street Journal had a lead editorial <coughs> coming out in favor of Apple. Yeah. It says Apple is right on encryption. And here is a question that they raised in the middle of this um, editorial. It says, one question is why the phone wasn't immediately shipped in a Faraday bag to Fort Meade. The National Security Agency has a formidable decryption unit. And U.S. spooks probably have the ability to hack the Rube's phone without Apple's services, especially because it is an older, less sophisticated model. Yeah. What? I, you know, I read that. And I don't know that's true. That, that, that's true. Like what? That they could have, they could have, uh, I mean, I've heard from uh, uh, very senior uh, law enforcement Justice Department officials um, that they literally cannot hack into an iPhone. Um, with all of the uh, extraordinary skills the NSA has, um, that that uh, particular feature that the iPhone has that you know you, um, you, know, you, you, you they call it a brute force attack when you try to uh, everybody you know has a, their passcode on their iPhone and you get ten chances to put in the right passcode. Um, it usually takes me four or five, <laughs> um, and after the tenth. Um, if you haven't gotten it right, everything is erased. Um, and what the government wants is the ability to be able to uh, try to get into that passcode thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of millions of times, uh, which their computers can do very quickly. Um, and it, I think it takes a matter of uh, days, weeks, maybe. Um, but after the tenth time, everything on the phone is erased. And my understanding is that the NSA, and you know, we, we have a uh, source um, who uh, was a high-level official of the NSA. I talked to him, who's, and he said, uh, 
just can't do it. Maybe 10 years from now, uh, the NSA will be able to do that. Uh, but by then, uh, the technology companies will have developed some. So there's an arms race that's going on. Um, and, um, and, and law enforcement and the intelligence agencies are, are behind. Uh, just two more points on that. I just want to make one is, you know, I did read that in the, in the journal editorial today, which I thought was fascinating. And I don't know this, but having covered these sorts of things for many years, it did make me wonder if we just have, you know, the old syndrome of, you know, the FBI not wanting to deal or share or share credit with or give credit to another intelligence agency we're going to do it on ourselves we don't need the nsa for this and of course they bump it right. um but secondly the other point is it's worth noting that you know the nsa and mike rogers has a somewhat different perspective on these issues than comey because you know he's also uh, in charge of the u.s cyber command and the preventing cyber attacks and um, encryption is a very important part of our cyber defenses. And the more you might open the door to a weakening of encryption so that the FBI and law enforcement can get into phones, you're also opening the door for uh, foreign hackers and foreign intelligence agencies to get the same information. So um, he's been, you know, uh, uh, playing a very balanced yeah, yeah. Right. right. I mean, so we, Mike's interview with Admiral Roberts is on the Yahoo mm -hmm. website, and I would encourage all of you who are interested in this subject to look it up because it's a fascinating um, interview. Um, I don't know whether there was more of it that was off the record or anything like that, but it was really interesting, and the whole encryption question was, you know, this is just where we are, and uh, he was uh, not a um, just a now, he was concerned about these encrypted apps that, yes. that are making yes. it difficult for the NSA to intercept the communications of um, ISIS yes. and Al-Qaeda and other terrorists. Mm -hmm. That is a real issue for the NSA because you know, we have seen them move more and more into um, apps like uh, Telegram, which is based in Berlin, uh, which advertises the, uh, the ability to have your communication stay encrypted and stay dark from um, anybody trying to um, uh, uh, intercept them, or, uh, including intelligence agencies. So that's um, a phenomenon that's very real, and one of the things he said in the interview is that we were not, that the Paris terrorists um, uh, had, in fact, used encrypted communications. This was something that there was um, a lot of back and forth in, uh, about in the days after the attacks. That's the piece that we wrote um, before we knew whether or not they did. We just knew that this was a concern. Uh, and um, and Rogers did in fact uh, confirm that um, they were unable to intercept the communications, even though they knew who some of these Paris um, uh, terrorists were. They were not able to um, listen in. Uh, you know, I was talking to Dan earlier. We used to hear back in the day of you know 9/11, before, or after, about chat. You know, what's the NSA would be picking up chatter from the terrorists? Are they talking about that, that? And chatter was the sort of shorthand for intercepted communications that might indicate that there was some terrorist uh, attack afoot. You almost never hear about that these days. You know why? Because it's all encrypted. Mm -hmm. So the NSA doesn't pick up chatter mm -hmm. in the same way. Um, I, I would love for you uh, guys to talk a little bit about how that Paris uh, came about. You it's said there's a backstory to it's, it. It's, it's funny. Um, uh, we were actually in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, we were, uh, I guess, fittingly in a way, uh, we were out there for a conference uh, that Yahoo was putting on. Uh, it's called Digital Democracy. It was really about how uh, how politics has been trans politics and, and, and governing um, has been transformed um, by uh, technology. And in fact, Mike. Uh, the panel that Mike moderated was, was an interview with a guy named uh, Matt Olson, uh, who was the uh, 
uh, uh, director of the uh, uh, National Capital Terrorism Center under the Jim Lee Obama, about three years of the Obama administration, and also had been the general counsel of the NSA, and got into some of these very issues, um, you know, the whole encryption question and whether uh, a technology company should provide a back door so that law enforcement could get into iPhones. Um, conference was finished, um, and we had, a, a, I guess, another day before the Democratic uh, uh, debate was going to take place, uh, actually at the same university where the conference was. I don't know where you were, if you were with me, but uh, so it, I was at lunch at a kind of famous uh, hamburger joint um, in Des Moines, and some of my colleagues there. Yeah, we were yeah. Right. Right. and all of a sudden getting notifications on our iPhones. Um, that there had been this horrendous attack. Actually, originally we didn't know it was like, you know, two we didn't know how bad it was. Yeah, the, the original, the first was reports, right. and then, but fairly quickly, uh, we uh, we found out that it was a really serious um, uh, terrorist attack. Um, and so, you know, we're just no matter where you are, you just start reporting. And so we were calling sources and, and um, trying to figure out, um, you know, what kind of a story could we do that would add some value? I was in touch. Uh, this kind of ironically, I was in touch with a uh, uh, with a longtime source um, who was um, a very senior law enforcement official, um, and we were communicating. Uh, I'm not going to say more than this, but um, our communications were um, encrypted. Um, I don't want to give away too much trade craft. Um, but um, Mike, both Mike and I, and a lot of other uh, reporters these days, um, uh, particularly reporters who do national security reporting or investigative reporting, um, and are concerned about their uh, sources, um, you know, uh, you know, being um, uh, investigated on these leak investigations that are, that are going on, are much more careful than we were years ago um, when everyone just would email. Um, and so, um, so I was trying to find out what was happening, uh, and, and if this source knew anything about the case, uh, this particular investigation. He's a former law enforcement official, but the first thing uh, that he said uh, was, um, "I'll bet you anything that uh, that the uh, uh, that." Uh, that they were using encrypted um, apps. Um, and he used the phrase, um, uh, these terrorists or these terrorist groups are going dark. Um, and this is something we need to look into. Um, and so we did more reporting and you know, ended up uh, doing a story uh, about, uh, and, and actually, as I recall, he mentioned uh, specific apps ones that I think Mike just mentioned, uh, Telegram, 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 and uh, WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. Telegram I'd never heard of. Uh, WhatsApp I was familiar with because from, it was popular in Europe. And you're um, iMessage. And iMessage. Um, and, um, and so uh, so we did a story that we had a lot of other reporting, but it wrapped in this issue as sort of as a central theme of the story. And I remember we made sure that we put going dark in the in the in the headline, um, and um, and the other thing um, that I remember uh, him this person saying is that he was torn um, and torn about uh, whether about uh, you know you know you know on the one hand um, these are uh, the, 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 you know, the privacy concern, um, but also. Uh, the fact that if you um, if, if you if you if long if you if technology companies create a back door, uh, you allow hackers and, and bad governments, as he put it, um, you know uh, you, you you know you give them all sorts of power. Um, on the other hand, um, the ability to get into you know iPhones and and, uh, and other technology is a critical uh, you know surveillance uh, capability. And so from that very first interview. Um, uh, you know, some of these kinds of dilemmas that have been playing out over, you know, many months now, it was clear to this person as yeah. we were seven that in the story. Of course, the other thing that got attention from that story is that in that interview, which I had done, or in that panel, 
which had done the day before um, the Paris attacks, in which I was talking to the, the former head of the NCTC about this issue. Yeah, he, of course, as many people in the intelligence community have done, blamed Edward Snowden and said, you know, it was the Snowden uh, disclosures that um, uh, led uh, ISIS and other terrorist groups towards these encrypted apps. Now, that's a, um, a controversial and explosive charge. Um, uh, and I think the uh, uh, having done a lot of reporting on this and pressed Rogers on it as well, he had a lot to say about the issue. Uh, he endorses that view, I think, uh, uh, although a little more nuanced than what you know, he says, and I think it's probably right, is that, look, technology was moving in this direction. Snowden <clears throat> accelerated. And it's not all on, on Snowden's uh, hands, but but he certainly contributed to it. And it is true, uh, if you believe what multiple intelligence officials have said, is that they were in the months after Snowden able to intercept communications in which the uh, uh, ISIS folks and others were saying, we have to be careful, citing the disclosures and saying we can't talk this way. Um, and uh, just to talk a little bit about the Snowden fact, I mean, wasn't it the Snowden fact that led Apple to encrypt its operating system because earlier models of the iPhone did not have encrypted operating systems? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, the, the Snowden, uh, you know, the, the Snowden um, leaks. Uh, Obviously, uh, you know, outraged uh, uh, a lot of people who didn't realize the government uh, had these programs, the metadata program and, and the 701 program. Um, 702. 702. Um, Be precise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, um, and, and I think that the, the uh, technology uh, companies came under you know, enormous uh, uh, pressure from, from users and from um, um, in, you know, uh, to uh, uh, protect their their privacy, um, and there's a commercial imperative here, a huge commercial imperative, um, which is, um, you know, uh, these are huge global companies, um, and um, the ability to protect the privacy of their, of their users and, and enormous, you know, really competitive um, is a is a you know major major. Um, you know, factor, and so, and, and, the, and the government will often say, you know, when, you know that that, uh, uh, that this is less about um, you know civil liberties and privacy interests and more about commercial imperatives. Um, I think they're intertwined, mm -hmm. and it's hard to separate them. Um, but Snowden, um, and you know, and the, and the interesting thing is, is that is that I was reading a piece today I think in Slate about it wasn't in, it really wasn't until Tim Cook. Uh, uh, you know, uh, did what he did. That technology companies, uh, you know, pushed back against uh, the government. You know, they had provided all sorts of, um, you know, you know, sort of, uh, you know, help to the government in these kinds of cases. So this is really a, a inflection point. It really is a seminal moment. Right, and, um, and Apple had cooperated as well. That's right. Apple in particular had cooperated. Mm -hmm. um, so. So absolutely. Um, uh, since they, since Apple cites the privacy concerns of their users, or their customers, um, um, why do you think the polls are so much in favor of the FBI? Is yeah, it the political you know, climate? Is it the fear of terrorism? Is it just are feelings still so raw uh, about San Bernardino and Paris? Well, I think I think one issue is in this particular case. You know, you're talking about uh, a single phone. Mm -hmm. Now, Apple makes the argument that it's a slippery slope, um, and that as soon as one judge, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, directs the government, uh, directs the technology at Apple uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to create a backdoor, that then all of a sudden uh, judges, you know, in, in case in, in a lot of cases will start doing this, and then you won't be able to control it. But I think there's probably some skepticism on the part uh, of the public 
um, that, uh, uh, that this is really um, you know going to lead to uh, you know a, a profound erosion um, of, of, of people's privacy concerns when they balance that against um, the outrage in this particular case. In this particular case, I don't think it's actually the last poll I saw. Was that it was 50, I think it was 51 percent. It wasn't overwhelmingly. Yeah, no, I saw polls against 55. I guess. Yeah. yeah, I think it's I think it's it, it, it's shifting. A bit. I yeah. think you know in, in the you know initially when it was presented like this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah people say yeah. Right. Damn straight. Get that phone. Find out who those other killers are. You know now people are beginning to have a little skepticism, or at least that that argument seems to have faded because. Really, there's not much to it. So now, you know, the pendulum has begun to change a little. Bit. I thought that Wall Street Journal editorial was a pretty significant um, uh, moment in this debate because, you know, they you would not expect the, the Wall Street Journal to be arguing a position against the intelligence community and the law enforcement community, but there they were. Um, now, of course, you know, the minute ISIS strikes next, you know, all that can change. So that's, you know, the nature of a debate like this. So the two of you have been covering national security issues for a long time. You've reported on all kinds of terrorist organizations and terrorist threats. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it's been like to report on ISIS, the Islamic State, and not just from techno technological perspective? On the one hand, and they seem to be very public they have become very adept at using propaganda uh, and social media and social media to advance their cause um, chris dickey our former colleague has said that you know terrorist organizations used to rely on the media to get their message out now they just I they are the well, I have to tell so. one short anecdote remember yeah. the day what was it in, um, uh, in summer September of 2014, and we were having lunch across the street yeah. from Yahoo, and we checked our iPhones, and there was this Stephen Sopoff beheading video, and mm -hmm. we watched it together on uh, our iPhone, and you know that was you know a pretty horrific experience to see. You know, and this you know, gruesome heading of uh, uh, American journals, of anybody. But, uh, uh, and I, you know, we covered Al Qaeda for years, and certainly there was um, uh, Daniel Pearl, but I don't think we ever had the video, uh, certainly not as accessible as this one. Uh, and so, you know, there was uh, just horrificness to what ISIS has been doing, and, you know, uh, asking in, their, you know, in, in just how bloody uh, they can be that, you know, it seems like so off the charts that um, it, it seems to be another, another But there again, um, that, that, that's an issue that, um, has kind of forced us to confront the technology companies to confront, you know, sort of the difficult balance between, um, in this particular case, um, kind of First Amendment and free expression, you know, versus security. So the uh, the, the social media platforms um, uh, have come under enormous um, pressure um, uh, from the government um, to be uh, to, to really police. Um, their sites to, 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 to prevent groups like ISIS uh, from using them uh, for uh, propaganda purposes. Um, on the other hand, they've got their users, um, you know, who, uh, who you know who, who really um, you know, care about um, the ability to use these platforms freely. Um, and uh, you know, um, and so uh, that's been. I mean, Mike's written about this. Uh, the government was enormously. Frustrated with Twitter in particular uh, for not cracking down on um, on how um, uh, uh, ISIS and other groups have recruited um, um, and and you know on, on Twitter and use Twitter for propaganda uh, purposes. And I think uh, you had an anecdote in one of your stories about how uh, 
the um, White House called in, um, what was that story that, that you know, the Lisa Monica story? Oh yeah, where uh, uh, in Twitter at that point wasn't returning the White what, House's phone call. Wouldn't even return the phone call. Yeah, this was like uh, Lisa Monica, the chief counterterrorism and homeland security advisor for the White House, and she couldn't get Twitter on the phone because they <laughs> were so reluctant to be uh, seen as cooperating in any way uh, with the White House. I mean, their view, which has begun to evolve, they you know, softened a bit, but their sort of view from the start was, we're not going to censor our network. That's what we're all about. We're all about free expression, and how do we decide you know, who we're going to take down and who we're not? Now, interestingly, um, I more recently interviewed um, Facebook's uh, top content cop, uh, because Facebook um, has been more uh, uh, aggressive about um, taking down terrorist content um, on its network. Uh, and has instituted some fairly um, well, more aggressive policies than any of the other social media networks, saying you know, anybody uh, who's a, a member of a terrorist group, uh, anybody who uh, uh, promotes terrorism, anybody who defends a terrorist act, we're going to take it down. Now, you know, that, and, and I, you know, they're saying that for public relations in the United States. But um, a lot of follow-up questions, which I would have liked to have asked, but they didn't give me as much time as I would have preferred, is, I mean, does Facebook have its own terrorist list? Do they decide who's a terrorist and who's not? You know, it's a big debate about a lot of groups around the world and who fits in that category and what's defending a terrorist act and what's not and, um, you know, who's making those decisions. Um, you know, one of the stories I remember, uh, and goes from one of your earlier stories that I thought was fasc fascinating and, and um, shows how sophisticated these, um, these terrorist organizations are, um, was I think it was, um, it was uh, the, the State Department uh, was trying to fight back against um, ISIS um, uh, to, to counter their propaganda, and they would make videos um, that uh, tried to depict ISIS as they are, a pretty horrific, violent um, uh, organization. And so they would show some of these terrible things that ISIS did as you know, counter propaganda. And then ISIS, uh, using. Um, uh, the terms of service agreement of YouTube's Trump. No, it was Twitter. Oh, Twitter. Was it Twitter? Twitter or, I can't remember if it was Twitter or YouTube, but they, they actually uh, it, it invoked. The terms of service agreements to get the State Department's videos taken down. Those terms of service that ban violent content. So when the State Department was trying to like uh, go after, which is basically, I mean, it's like uh, you know, jujitsu. You know, it's using you know our leveraging our strengths against us, right. which Al Qaeda also did by using our openness and our technology, and you know. Uh, to attack us on 9-11. So ISIS was using the terms of uh, service to shut down the State Department. Wow. And succeeded. <laughs> I, I thought in your interview with Admiral Rogers, he was very, um, I thought it was interesting that he was um, making a point about his concern about um, the recruitment of young people by ISIS, which has become a big story. Right. Through social media, young Americans. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I mean. How many? I think the FBI made something like 58 cases last year uh, uh, along these lines, um, and it's pretty amazing when you read some of those FBI cases uh, and read the charging documents. I mean, these are you know, could be neighbors of yours. Who go to school with your kids, and you know, on one hand, seem like uh, you know ordinary uh, Americans, uh, um, and you know, somehow they fall into the clutches of this seemingly bizarre ideology. And how that's happening, and why, and what the, the, the war is, is I think every something everybody's. Struggling with, I, I will say, if you look also at some of these ISIS, ISIS propaganda 
um, videos. They're pretty sophisticated. I mean, they are done really well, and you know, going to fight for Allah and struggle, and just like inspiring music, and you know. Um, you can sort of see how it sucks the really lines in. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Dan, they maybe we can talk a little about the political context about this whole uh, debate, um, the whole larger debate. Um, um, how do you see this issue playing out, you know, as we get to go down the road of the political presidential campaign? and. Uh, uh, who do you think the uh, voices are going to be in terms of the sort of national security today? Well, it's interesting. You know, I, I was uh, thinking about how, um, how in some ways, um, so little has changed um, in, in the eight year in terms of the, the kind of the political dimension of this um, in the eight year or post eight years that Obama's been president, um, when um, the Obama. Uh, administration announced its plan last week, I guess it was, uh, to close, to finally close down Guantanamo. So on the one hand, you know, we are, uh, you know, seven years uh, past uh, Obama's executive order when he promised to close down Guantanamo in one year, um, and um, here we are. Um, but also uh, the reaction uh, to this new plan uh, from um, uh, you know, primarily Republicans, but also Democrats in Congress, uh, when a you know major part of the plan is to is, is uh, to move some relatively small number of remaining detained in Guantanamo uh, to maximum um, uh, security uh, facilities here in the United States, where by the way, not not, not a single prisoner has ever escaped um, a maximum security prison in the United States, and um, you know it was it was. You know, oh my God! You know, uh, you know, the president is endangering our national security. Um, you know, we we absolutely can't um, afford to bring any of these people into the country um, because um, you know I, I don't know because they will escape and they will you know attack us and kill us. I mean, you know, and so. Um, uh, you know the. Like so, so little has has changed, um, and uh, we were talking before about about you know what Obama's legacy is going to be um, on, on on these issues, and I'm wary of you know prognosticating <laughs> about presidential legacies because I think it takes you know you know it takes when you look at you know what happened to Bill Clinton's uh, approval numbers after he left office, and and even George W. Bush now who's Faring quite a lot better than he did, but on, on these issues, um, I think it's um, um, it's in, you know so in the short term connected to uh, what happens to ISIS. That is considered the central counterterrorism threat uh, right now, and um, you know there has not been a uh, San Bernardino uh, side, and that was not that was not a uh, a externally directed uh, attack that was that came from within. Uh, there has not been an ISIS attack um, or a uh, Al Qaeda attack in this country, a significant ISIS or Al Qaeda attack since 9 11. Um, so, um, uh, unless um, you know we have another attack like that, um, my guess is, is over the long, long haul, um, Obama's um, uh, not going to be viewed as 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 the president who ended. Uh, the terrorism threat, but he probably won't uh, be blamed for making it worse. Um, and then, and, and, and on ISIS, and you know, maybe you might disagree with this, I think um, the debate is, is going to continue to be as it is now, but who's responsible for the, for the emergency of ISIS? Um, is, it, is it Obama for having not negotiated a status of forces agreement uh, with the Iraqis? Um, and um, uh, and, 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 and then withdraw, having withdrawn from Iraq, creating a vacuum that led to the emergence of ISIS, or is it the, the original sin um, of invading um, Iraq in the first place? And I don't think that's a debate that's going to be resolved in um, any, any, any time, any time soon. And I think my, 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 my guess is over the long haul, um, you know, uh, uh, that's not one that's going to. 
Well, I, I don't know. I don't want to say how that will affect them. I, 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 I do too soon to say. I, I do think. Say. I, I do. Of course, you know, 10 years, 20 years now, who knows? But I do think a lot is going to hinge on um, what the state of ISIS is uh, when he leaves office in January. And if they are still holding huge spots of territory in Iraq and Syria, they're still in control. And also, they've uh, uh, taken control of large portions of Libya. Um, uh, you know, then I think uh, that is going to be a very big shadow on uh, Obama's legacy. This is something that happened on his watch. Uh, and um, uh, if you take it from the moment, you know, when uh, he got bin Laden in 2010, which is when he wanted his legacy on terrorism to be, to you know, where we are right now. And um, it's not it's not at all the way the White House would like it. Well, I'll just with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, we know that what Donald Trump has said about going after ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say, can I just say you know about the election? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, Hillary Clinton probably has like 500 foreign policy advisors. Anybody, you know, in academia who count themselves as a foreign policy advisor to Hillary Clinton who's probably on some committee helping to write policy papers. It's not clear Donald Trump has any foreign policy <laughs> advisors. And um, so this will be an interesting election in that sense alone. Right. Uh, how about, Assuming they're the two nominees. And uh, just, um, uh, and then sort of issues that won't go away, uh, what do you think about the question of Hillary uh, Clinton's evening? Yeah, well, uh, interesting because uh, uh, while Comey was at that uh, uh, hearing yesterday and all the news was about Apple and encryption, he actually made a very interesting comment because uh, he got asked. And I think I have it in this notebook. Let me see. Oh, yes. Um, uh, um, you know, one of the Republicans said, you know, look, there's a lot of questions about this, we know you're investigating, are we ever going to learn what you found, what's going on, and he said, what I can assure you is that I am very close personally to that investigation to ensure that we have the resources we need, including people in technology, you know, there's no way the FBI tries to do, all its work independently, commonly, Um I thought that was kind of a curious comment. To make. It's the third time now Cohen has said something like this. Uh, in two previous times he said that he's being briefed regularly on the investigation. Yesterday he said I'm very close personally to that investigation. You know, I don't know. He just could be covering himself so that when he has to answer to Chuck Grassley and the Senate Judiciary Committee, he can make assurances. But um, in my experience, uh, you know, the FBI director doesn't get briefed regularly and is not pers close personally to investigations that aren't going anywhere. And I think there is a reasonable chance, based on what we know, uh, that the FBI has something here. Uh, and that they are taking it seriously. Can I ask, can I ask, yeah. 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 ask yeah. a question? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Obviously, it's not. It's, at the end of the day, it's not the FBI's right. uh, decision whether to um, have, uh, bring criminal charges. They make a recommendation. Yes. And in a case like this, um, pretty sensitive case, uh, particularly um, you know so close to an election, and, and a, it, at least a subject of the investigation is the uh, likely standard bearer of the Democratic yes. Uh, yes. Party. So, my a couple of questions. One, yeah. the politics yeah. of, uh, um, of going after a, um, a the you know, a nominee of, a, of, of one or two uh, right. uh, parties, and, and to, this is a decision that would have to be made at the highest levels of the Justice Department. Um, I don't know whether Laurel well, has hey. a relationship, but, but are there recusals that will have to happen? Will they have to appoint a uh, uh, is a special prosecutor? I mean, has that question been? Well, it, it, yes, it has, and there have been calls for a independent counsel under the regulations. But based on what on what you and I both know about who the personalities are that Comey would be making this recommendation to, I can't see any of them. Um, John Carlin the assistant that, uh, attorney general for national security, uh, and going up to Loretta, 
glitch um, blocking a recommendation or squelching a recommendation by the FBI director on such a sensitive matter. Um, uh, Boy, isn't, isn't that, that isn't that isn't isn't that in itself a reason to recuse? Uh, you, and that argument right, has because, been made by because, people that, because, that, that they couldn't. Right. Yeah. Um, but I don't think anybody wants to go there. Let me just say, look, based on based on what we know, um, there are several different scenarios by which this can play out. You know, one is you know criminal charges against the world. I think that's you know probably not likely. But are some of her senior aides who were writing emails to her on this unclassified server? Um, uh, and facing possible exposure. Yeah, there was a very interesting story broken by our former colleague Mark Hosenball last week that um, the content of some of these emails written by her aides to Hillary tracked the language very closely of classified reports by the intelligence community, which means, if you follow the logic, that some people were reading on the classified system um, intelligence reports, and then writing a sort of you know laundering them or sanitized version with the same language on the unclassified system, which suggests that if they were doing it with you know, foreknowledge and purpose, knowing that that's exactly what they did, then they are potentially exposed to uh, charges of mishandling classified information. Um, that's not necessarily the Espionage Act, but it's there's a misdemeanor charge that David Petraeus pled to uh, of mishandling classified information, and I think that's the most likely Far charge away. that could be since brought here, and mentioned. would have huge political implications. Since, since you mentioned um, yeah. Petraeus, I mean, this is just a point about how the sausage gets made yeah. um, in, in these investigations. Uh, uh, the, 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 the Process, the uh, agents of the FBI who were involved in this case, as brick agents as they're called, um, were infuriated um, by how the Petraeus case uh, played out because they thought that the misdemeanor charge in the end was just a slap on the wrist um, and um, that, uh, um, that there was, you know, political interference or, you know, uh, yeah. and, and, and I think that is, that view I am sure is affecting the way they view this particular case, and I imagine um, that uh, Comey. I guess I imagine I, I don't know this. I don't know what he's thinking, but but I'm guessing um, that Comey um, is, uh, in, at least in the back of his mind, um, is thinking about how his agents, um, you know, are viewing this this particular investigation in light of what happened to Petraeus. Um, and those are some of the kind of human factors um, that affect um, how these investigations play out. Yeah. I, look, I, I, you know, I, I, I am not predicting here that there's going to be criminal charges because I don't know. I, I do know that in many years of covering these things, when you unleash the FBI, um, more often than not, they tend to find something. You know, it may not be what we're talking about, but they may have found something. Um, uh, it is interesting to me that all those, that, that several of those top aides uh, who are potentially exposed, uh, Cheryl Mills uh, and Jake Sullivan, and there's another one who sort of the uh, emails, all have the same lawyer, same high powered Washington lawyer, Beth Wilkinson. This is David Gregory, um, who is undoubtedly working closely with David Kendall. Uh, Hillary Clinton's longtime lawyer on these matters in a joint defense agreement. Um, I think there's reason to think that people are taking this quite seriously on both sides. And what about Hillary's um, contention that some of this material was classified after the fact? Right. Yeah, and you know that's true. But if you follow the scenario that I presented before, if in fact. It, you know, they were taking, you know, what, what she said is they weren't marked classified at the time. So the emails that got sent to her by her top aides didn't say classified, this is classified information. Duh, that was the whole point. They were taking the classified information and putting it into an unclassified system, knowing 
you know, theoretically knowing what they were doing, and therefore were of course not going to identify it as classified in the emails they're sending to her on the unclassified private server. Yeah, one thing that, that I was so surprising to me, so, some of these emails, uh, a number of them are about the drone, the CIA drone program, which remains a classified uh, program, although everyone kind of talks openly about it. Um, Mike Hayden, uh, the director of the CIA and the, also the National Security Agency, but the CIA when the drone program was really ramping up, just wrote a whole book. Yeah. Um, and uh, about um, you know national security and, and, and I've read parts of it. A lot of it is about the CIA drone program, which he yeah. writes about completely openly. Right. So I, I don't. I, well, I mean, Obama talked about the drone program in 2013, right? right. So he sort of well, declassified. declassified. When a right. president discloses a, the president is the only. Person classification who is actually allowed, allowed to talk about anything uh, he wants. And he just automatically declassifies it if he talks about it. Right. So maybe that's the answer. So at this point, I think it might be um, a good idea to open up uh, the, the event to questions. Um, we will have microphones coming around. My only request is that your question be a question <laughs> and with a quest question mark. Uh, these are very heated issues we've been discussing. I really don't want to hear speeches. I would like to hear questions. And um, so get the microphone. Start? Yes. I I can speak loud oh, enough. Coming. Oh, thank you. And uh, if I understand it correctly, the uh, master key does not exist. The court had to force Apple. Now my question is, how can a court intervene in commerce and industry? And force a company to create a product they don't want to do it, yeah, that's a, and then and then if they do it for the CIA, then Europe that fight ISIS or or Saudi Arabia that fight ISIS will come and say, "Give me the key if you want to do business in my country," and then destroy Apple. That's a that's a powerful legal argument, which which. Uh, Apple, exactly the one has Apple, which making. Apple is making. They're, they're making that argument, which you can't, you know, compel. Um, and, and Apple has, has said that in this particular case, for this particular iPhone, I think it would be weeks of work, uh, dozens of people working on it. Um, and as a third party, you know, that, that is, a, I, I'm not sure what the, the violation of the commerce law or whatever it is. Uh, but um, and they're uh, making a First Amendment case, and they're as well. also and they're also making a First Amendment and case. Code is a form of speech. That, that code is a form of speech, and then you can't compel uh, you can't compel speech, uh, and um, and so those are um, uh, legal unresolved uh, legal questions that are are likely to end up in the Supreme Court. I think they're uh, the, the, these very issues are being briefed right now. Um, and I think the uh, the initial appeal is before the magistrate who originally compelled Apple um, to do this. I think it's uh, they're going to argue argue this uh, on March twenty second um, in uh, in California. But I, I these are novel legal issues um, that are going to end up in the Supreme Court. Um, you know, although Apple would prefer that they end up in Congress. Gentlemen on the aisle. Thank you. Uh, how, if at all, does the fact that the phone in question is owned by the county rather than a private citizen affect the conversation? I mean, actually, that was uh, a point that was made by the Justice Department in its very first talking points. You know, this, this phone didn't even belong to um, the San Bernardino terrorists, it belonged to the county. Uh, and they've, they've hit that point very hard. Um, uh, you know, but on the other hand, I mean, most of us who are employed use iPhones that are, or, you know, um, devices that are owned by our employers, but we have all our personal information on it. Um, so, um, it's you know a point that probably modestly helps the government, but you know, I don't think it's conclusive. 
Yes. Just wait for the mic. Thank you very much. Um, there's a long uh, romance in America uh, with anti-government figures, the John Brown insurrection that broke the Civil War, uh, the saga of Bonnie and Clyde, uh, the hundreds of supporters of Clyde and Bundy and his 30-year feud, 20-year feud with the federal government. ISIS, I'm sure, some of its attraction to some people is its anti-government message. Do you see this playing out? Um, you know, I, I don't think Apple uh, is quite the sort of, you know, romantic figure that some of, you know, or have the romantic appeal that some of the, you know, individuals you mentioned might, may have had to some. Um, it's a big multinational corporation. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, think, I think that, 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 uh, Maybe Tim Cook's Apple. Uh, it, it, he he is a I think he is a, uh, a pretty strong libertarian, and I think his views are pretty different from Steve Jobs. I understand it. I mean, as we talked about before, I mean, Apple is, and, and most of these technology companies are going to have a hard time, you know, making that case. They're you know they've been cooperating with the government for a very long time, um, and uh, actually our company Yahoo might. Uh, Knows a lot about this. Uh, fought a pretty heroic battle um, against uh, the government in secret, um, in secret um, during the whole, um, you know, the, 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 the original Bush administration. Uh, it was called the TSD program, the surveillance program, um, and eventually were uh, kind of brought to their knees by the threat of massive fines um, that would have uh, essentially bankrupted the company. Um, uh, but for the most part, these companies, I think, are, are you know, it's, it's hard to, to make that either compromise because they have been cooperating with uh, the federal government, uh, you know, for a very long time. Yes. So um, you all mentioned that one of the arguments not to unlock this iPhone is that that technology to unencrypt devices could then get into the hands of the quote unquote bad guys or the bad governments. Um, however, in the old days, the all this encryption, wasn't that technology available to the intelligence community and therefore also available to the bad guys and the bad governments? So what is the difference now? Have we gotten stricter about privacy or, or why is there this new concern? It's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, I think we have gotten I think the, the Snowden effect um, is is you know part of the answer. Um, um, I think you know just think how quickly we've evolved in terms of the use of this technology. I mean I can remember Mark you were probably there not that long ago when um, and Alexis you were probably there too when uh, Steve Jobs came to Newsweek um, and. Um, uh, showed us the iPhone before anybody could see it. It was really a, quite an extraordinary moment to sort of hold this thing. And um, I, I think. He dropped it on the floor twice. Yeah. Yeah. To show us how resilient it was. I mean, we were all really. When, when I dropped my iPhone. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. We, were, we were all incredibly impressed, but I don't think we had any idea how many transformations it would be. I was thinking about this uh, earlier today, you know, knowing that we were going to you know, be here. I think one of the interesting, uh, the difference between, you know, like, um, law enforcement um, has, you know, you know, with court orders and, and you know, has, has uh, been able to search people's homes and their, uh, and their safes um, and, and even their hard drives and their computers for a very long time. Um, but there's a, there's just such a fundamental difference between um, between those kinds of searches and an iPhone or a smartphone, which is um, which is just an extension of yourself. I mean, everything is on that iPhone, and you know nobody leaves their home without it. And if they do, it's a crisis. <laughs> um, um, and you know, you, your all your pictures and your health information, your financial information, and, and um, 
this isn't really responsive to your question, but I think it has to do with the evolution, the, the incredibly uh, fast evolution of technology. That you know, it wasn't that long ago when um, you know the technology was not that valuable to uh, to law enforcement the way it is now. Um, the gentleman uh, next to Alan and then Al. <coughs> Hi. Um, I guess so related to that last question and comment, uh, to your knowledge, is there any U.S. legal precedent that guarantees a private citizen's right to have the equivalent of an unbreakable safe uh, encrypted device? I don't know any, any uh, I mean, uh, Congress has not weighed in on this. Um, uh, in, in, in the context of technology. You know, these issues have been sort of, you know, winding their way through the courts for years. I remember now a um, story I did for Newsweek. Um, it must have been early in 2009 or 2010 about um, uh, GPS locational data on your cell phone and how there were, um, the government was not just the FBI, but local law enforcement was increasingly seeking uh, uh, data to identify where somebody was based on your, because cell phone the GPS can identify where you've been. So I mean, the headline was you know about something about how the FBI can find out where you are from the cell phone in your pocket, and basically a few magistrates, you know, this kind of parallels this case a little bit, were starting to resist on that and say, wait a second, this is quite an invasion of privacy. You, you have to turn over uh, to some local sheriff or any you know, a, um, a information that can identify where you've been at all times and think of the potential for abuse of that. That's been challenged in the courts. It's gone up to several circuit court uh, opinions, but I'm not sure. Supreme Court has weighed in on one GPS locational uh, issue relating to on your car, but I'm not sure they've resolved the cell phone issue. So this has been going on for four or five years. Left to the courts, this issue could you know, be going on for quite as much time as that. I think part of the slippery slope argument is that I think what you hear Apple uh, and privacy advocates talking about is that if you if this case were resolved in favor of the government, um, that the government would then be able to compel uh, uh, technology from certain parties like Apple or you know, Microsoft um, to um, you know, turn on you know, surreptitiously without you knowing about it. Turn on um, you know your, uh, your 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 camera, uh, your your uh, recorder, um, you know, and and you know so that you know so so that without you knowing about it, you know they're uh, the government is, you know, watching you. So I mean, that really is a big problem. Which, and that it? really, I mean, yeah, I mean that really is the ultimate or really terrifying yeah. thought. Yes. Um, Although I did just read a piece about how hackers can actually they hack into your system. They can use the camera in your computer to watch everything you're doing. Right. Yeah. Yes. Right. Now, where Where does the onion router and Bitcoin for the university. Oh, my God. You want to take that one? No. <laughs> I still don't understand Bitcoin. Yeah. I just want to say that for the record. All right. Um, this gentleman on the aisle. We certainly need uh, talented people as far as cybersecurity is concerned with the government. Um, and I understand there's a serious recruitment problem getting people to work for the government. We have what we call, I guess, in some countries we call them patriots. They actually do want to help the government, but these individuals tend to be nonconformists. They also tend to have sometimes criminal records, and the government has very strict regulations as far as security clearance for them to work for the government. So there's a gap there that seems to be getting wider. And either of you heard any sort of resolution on how the government can. 
uh, bringing more of these talented people to help us you know, defend um, our cybersecurity. I, I thought where you were going with that is, is and maybe this is part of what you're suggesting, that, that recruitment has been uh, made more difficult because of uh, the Snowden revelations as well, and sort of the sense of like why would people want to work for this you know, evil government. But um, I don't know. Uh, I think I've heard anecdotally that recruitment has is, is, is been more generalized in the European Union. Okay. Uh, what I do know, and we've heard this from um, you know people we know who work at the NSA, um, is that you know a lot of the mathematicians and the cryptologists that work there are. I mean, they're they're you know ponytail. I mean, they're 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 not exactly um, you know your typical GS eight. You know, um, and so and so they they you know those are those are the kinds of people um, who they're looking for. And I think they do understand um, that sometimes they have maybe not criminal records. Sometimes they have eccentric um, views, or and, and I think they're. Fairly tolerant um, of, of that, um, but need, obviously need to be careful. And probably in the wake of Snowden, um, uh, are, are even more uh, careful. But it's a very interesting question, and I think it's probably worth checking in on. Um, there is a, there is a, uh, there is clearly a cultural gap. I mean, um, in that interview with uh, Admiral Rogers, I asked him if he'd seen the Sims before, mm -hmm. um, and he said no. Uh, and then I mentioned uh, that there's going to be a new uh, Oliver Stone movie on Snow coming out later this year, uh, which will undoubtedly get a lot of attention and uh, play very well. He said he's not planning to he says he has no plans to. Well, so I'll bet you there are people inside the NSA who have seen it, you know, a lot of people, you know, at lower levels. Yeah. Um, question on the aisle there. Hi, going back to the uh, last topic you touched on, I'm kind of curious if, to the best of your knowledge, Hillary Clinton is unique in terms of being a person of high echelon within an administration that utilized a uh, private server in her home uh, for emails that uh, were other communication. She, she is not unique in using private emails for government business. She is, so far as we know, unique in having set up a Private server uh, in our home to conduct all uh, business, um, and that was something that hadn't been done before, and that sort of took it to another level beyond. You know, of course, you know, Hillary Clinton's defenders are very quick to talk about. You know, Colin Powell used the, uh, the personal emails and, and Condoleezza Rice, although. Rice's people say she didn't use email at all. Um, but, um, uh, uh, you know, the fact of setting up an entire system that couldn't really be accessed by anybody, um, your Gmail account um, could, if somebody could you know, go through the court process if they needed to provide an email server, was sort of basically unknown to you know, other people. And was, by the way, a total evasion of the Freedom of Information Act, which is a law passed by Congress, which people are supposed to take seriously. There are memos that go out at the beginning of every administration saying, FOIA is your responsibility. You must take this seriously. And there was an entire Office of Freedom of Information Act that was processing requests for the secretary's emails on certain issues, and they would routinely send them to Cheryl Mills, the chief of staff, and she would just routinely reply, no responsive documents, of course, because they're, you know, she was using a private email system that uh, 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 evaded the freedom of information. Um, no small thing to people who believe about in transparency in government. I think we have time for one more question. We don't have a question. So I am going to thank um, Mike and Dan for <laughs> And uh, uh, as our a former boss of ours used to say, the bar is open. Remind <laughs> <laughs> everybody about people. Oh, yes. Uh, we have, we have uh, 
copies of preview which has a chronology of all upcoming events a little bit anticlimactic after what you've just heard but there's lots coming up so pick up preview and read about it yeah. so, we're right. we're so, we're so, so hot.